Hi everyone, Danielle from Glembo here with our Glembo from Home program. Today we're going to focus on our fur trade gallery. We're going to do a quick tour of the gallery and then look at some artifacts a little bit closer and look at the people who were involved. Hi everyone and welcome to our exploration and fur gallery or our fur trade gallery. Today, we're going to look around at our gallery, learn a brief history of the fur trade and its impact on the people, and focus on this guy right here, the beaver. For thousands of years, hundreds of First Nations communities were living and thriving in what we now know as Canada. Part of this everyday survival in our sometimes harsh climate was knowing how to survive. Understanding the land, the animals, and the weather patterns was essential for living in our sometimes unforgiving land. The First Nations and Inuit people have lived on this land for generations, and the land, water, sky, plants, and animals are a part of their life and their belief systems. They understand how to live together and how to flourish together. The first explorers from Europe in the late, arrived in the late 1400s, but it wasn't until about 300 years later that fur trading really started booming in Canada. In 1670, the Hudson's Bay Company, or HBC, was established, and as the first official company in Canada, the trade of furs became a large part of the building of our nation as we know it now. Right around this time, there was a fashion that was exploding in Europe, and everyone who was anyone wanted a felt hat. And hats that were made from beaver fur were the ones especially people wanted. These hats were so popular that they almost completely wiped out the population of beaver in Europe. And so the explorers came to Canada. It became well known that Canada had large beaver populations and their fur was quite luxurious and so Canada's beaver pelts became a large focus for fur traders. Now imagine, hundreds of years ago, you've come from a completely different place, in some cases a city, to the middle of Canada. You're surrounded by forests, water and nature. You have no idea how to survive, what to eat, what to drink without getting sick, how to get through the seasons of harsh weather. You needed help. You needed help from the people that had lived here for thousands of years. And so relationships developed with First Nations and Inuit peoples with fur traders to trade furs, but to also help the traders survive. With these relationships, the newly arrived fur traders were shown trade routes that were already being used by the indigenous people for generations. These roots found large amounts of beaver and other furs, and eventually a method of trade was found. A made beaver is a beaver pelt that was cleaned and ready to trade for many items. You see, when the first Europeans arrived, they brought with them materials such as metal, fabric, glass beads and thread, candles and guns, just to name a few. These items were new to the First Nations and Inuit and quickly became popular for trading. Trading posts like this one were started and the fur trade began to help create what we now know as Canada. Now, the fur trade has hundreds of years of history that we can't cover all of today. I'll leave that up to you to do some extra investigating on the side. Instead, we're going to look at some artifacts and belongings and try and understand how life changed. There are three main things we want to focus on today. Number one, how a hat could change us as people. Number two, how these relationships and materials change the way that people lived. And three, how an entirely new culture the Métis came to be. Stick with us and we'll open up our suitcase and take a look. Okay everyone, here we are with some of our fur trade artifacts that we've pulled from our programs that we do at Glembo at the museum when we're open. And what these artifacts are going to show us today is how when 
the fur traders first came to Canada, they brought with them certain materials that changed the way that people lived. Now, the first thing I want to show you is the hat that really honestly changed um, North America and Canada and brought these settlers over to start the fur trade. Now, this hat was worth a lot of money in those days and almost completely wiped out a species of animal, the beaver, in Europe. So, this is the hat. Now, doesn't it look fancy? These types of hats were made out of the felt of the beaver. So when we look closely at this beaver pelt, we're gonna look at it closely, hopefully you can see it. These are called guard hairs that are on the top. And then underneath, there's this really beautiful, soft, almost felt-like fur that's underneath. This was the fur that, that people wanted for the hats. And there was a very long process that we will tell you a little bit about in, in some of our supplementary material about how they would make these hats. So this hat really honestly changed North America, changed Canada for sure, and started the fur trade. Now, the fur trade wasn't just about beaver. There was other types of furs that were involved but some of the materials that were brought over really did change the ways of life, especially for um, the First Nations and Inuit people. The, the pieces that we have here today are going to focus on um, the Blackfoot people because we live in traditional Blackfoot territory in Calgary. And so that's where we're going to focus today. The fur trade out here wasn't as focused on the beaver, it was focused a little bit more on um, bison and other types of furs like fox and wolf and things like that. But it still changed the way that people lived and it was the same across Canada for all First Nations people. So when we look at something like this, this is actually a bone. And it's quite a large bone, so we know that it's from a fairly big animal. And you can see that it's been modified, okay? And the reason we know it's a bone is we've got this uh, bulbous part here. This is what the, where the joint would be. And then also, we've got this hollow area here that tells us it's a bone because inside our bones we have marrow, okay? So this bone was modified and turned in, and if you look really closely, you can see that it's been um, kind of shaved off and sharpened at the end. This is what we call a flesher. This is a bone flesher. And this was used in the process of skinning animals. So um, when you were taking the fur away from the meat and the skin away from the meat, then you would go back in with your flesher and you would scrape off all the excess um, skin and fat and fur and get it really clean so that you could start turning the skin into different types of clothing or teepees. There was all kinds of things that were being made. Okay. Now this is a traditional tool that the Blackfoot people would have been using. When the fur traders came over, one of the main materials that they brought with them was metal. So this is a metal flesher. So it's similar in use. It's quite heavy, if you can feel it. It's been wrapped in some kind of leather skin here. And you can see really closely again that the end has been sharpened and it's been pounded down. Now a lot of times what they did was they would take um, the barrel of a gun that could no longer be used and they would repurpose it. They would recycle it, reuse it. And actually the First Nations people were pretty amazing and very thrifty when it came to this and really were some of the first reusers and recyclers that we know of, okay? So what we wanna look at is the materials. How would this have changed? We know how we would have gotten a bone through hunting and things like that. How would we have gotten metal? There was different ways of getting metal and producing metal. When we look at something like an arrow, this is a traditional arrowhead here. 
okay that stone on the end and then of course we've got our stick and our feathers we look really close okay the stone on the end is the part that ended up changing over the years over the years again they started using metal so we have to think to ourselves what do we think is better is there one that's better is there pros and cons good and bad about each of these um, materials metal as we know and we can see it on this scraper really well that 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 um, brownish tinge that's rust rust eats away at metal is this a good thing is this a bad thing is there a pro or a con can we find things like stone if we look again these are um, this would have been like an axe head. Okay, this is what we call chert. Stone that's found all around Alberta. And here's our metal axe head. Very, very heavy actually. And remember as well, that the Blackfoot people were moving around on a regular basis. Okay, they were following the migration of animals because the, their food sources were coming from hunting, mostly hunting, not a lot of fishing or anything like that in this area. Here's another example of some things that changed. This is a moccasin, okay, I think you can see it. And on this moccasin, there's, this is um, deer hide here. This is a little bit of a harder skin on the bottom. And then these are actually porcupine quills. So this is traditionally what they would have been using to decorate moccasins, clothing, things like that. On the side, these are glass beads. So these beads are the types of beads that would have come over with the Europeans, come over with the settlers, as well as thread and fabric okay now porcupine quills it was a very long process to try and collect the quills dye them with all natural dyes um, and and sew them in whereas the glass beads kept a nice bright color the holes were already poked inside of them so you just had to sew them on with thread they didn't break down quite as much. You can see the breaking down of the porcupine quills. This is the kind of stuff we've got to be really gentle with at the museum. But the glass beads lasted a little longer. Nice bright colors. But again, you had to get collect furs to trade for things like these beads. This also gives us good timelines around timing because if you see glass beads, if you see metal, if you see um, any kind of fabric like this kind of cloth, then you know that it's after the fur trade, okay? It's after the European settlers came to uh, Canada as we know it now. So also another thing that happened was there was a whole entire new culture that was formed from the fur trade. And that is the Métis. So when you see a sash like this, and usually people will wrap it around their waist, when you see a sash like that, this is a sign that this is someone from the Métis nations. The Métis were a mix of First Nations and certain European settlers. And nowadays we think of it as the First Nations people that were from the Red River Valley or um, the Red River area in Manitoba. And they were, um, they came over, the fur traders came over, lots of French and lots of European, British, Scottish fur traders. And they started to um, learn from the First Nations people because as we said in the gallery opening this was a very very harsh place to live if you didn't know wh what you were doing where to go how to find food what animals to look for um, what you could drink and not drink the plants you could eat and not eat 
coming here as someone who knew nothing, this was very important, these relationships between the First Nations people and the European people that were coming over. So when they came over, they created relationships with one another and in turn also started an entirely new culture. If the women, the First Nations women, were um, marrying or getting into relationships with the um, European men, then they would have um, what we now call Métis children. And that's how the Métis were born in Canada. This is where the culture came from. Okay? So, what I want you to do is, I want you to look at some of the pros and cons of these materials, okay? So if we're going to look at something like metal, we're going to say, if these are, if, if we we're going to compare these two scrapers, okay, these two flushers and scrapers, um, which one do you think is better? Is one better? What are the differences? Is there good? Is there um, things that might be negative? Right away, one of the things that I think is negative is that the, the metal starts to rust away. Does that have, does that affect the way that we're going to use these tools? Do we need to make them more often? When we look at something like a bone, think about all of the things you have to go through, hunting-wise, in order to get this bone. And you also have to make sure that it's sharp all the time and you're taking good care of it, okay? So, is there pros and cons to keeping the, the scraper a bone or the flusher a bone? Or is there pros and cons to keeping the scraper or a flusher metal? Is there pros and cons to having metal arrowheads versus stone arrowheads or metal, um, axe heads to stone? Is there pros and cons to using porcupine quills in our moccasin as opposed to glass beads? Tell us what you think. We're going to attach a sheet for you so you can do this really easily at home and maybe your mom and dad can help you, okay? So I hope you guys have a great day and have fun.